Hi everyone, my name is Hung Kwat and I am an Associate Professor of Haematology at the University of Melbourne and I'm a Clinical uh, Haematologist at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. Over the last several months there's been an increasing concern within the Malam community about COVID-19 and many people are rightfully are looking to their health professionals as well as uh, patient support groups such as Malam Australia for guidance in this unprecedented uh, time. So over the next uh, five minutes, on behalf of Marlam Australia, I'd like to address some of the uh, common questions I get asked uh, in the hope that this may bring some clarification about the impact of COVID-19 on patients with multiple myeloma and treatments in Australia. So the first question is, how does COVID-19 affect people with blood cancers, including multiple myeloma? Well, having a blood cancer doesn't necessarily change the risk or the way in which a person catches COVID-19, but because of the weakened immune system associated with the multiple myeloma and or treatment, a person with myeloma who is infected by COVID-19 may experience more severe symptoms and is at a higher risk of ending up in intensive care. So what can a person with multiple myeloma do to minimise the risk of COVID-19? Well, firstly, because we have no effective treatment against COVID-19, the best method is still prevention. That is, like everyone else, you must follow the standard precautions set out by the Department of Health and Human Services. That is, comply with social distancing measures, wash your hand frequently, avoid touching your face, and apply cough etiquette at all times, that is coughing or sneezing into uh, your elbow or upper arm to minimize droplet spreads. Secondly, uh, you need to optimize your general health uh, and uh, immune system. And that is to enable you to cope with the infection if you do get it. There's really no shortcut in optimising your general health and immune system beyond uh, a healthy lifestyle, uh, that is uh, a healthy diet and general exercise. If you are a patient who is already receiving immunoglobulin supplement to boost your immunity and your antibody levels, depending on the status of your hospital, this may or may not be able to be continued. So at St Vincent's Hospital, we're uh, in the process of uh, converting all intravenous immunoglobulin to a subcutaneous injection, that is injection through the skin, so that uh, the patient may be able to self-inject at home without the need to attend a hospital. And in patients with active multiple myeloma, in fact, the best way to optimise the immune system is uh, active treatment of the myeloma itself. And so this brings me to the next important question. Will myeloma treatment increase the risk of contracting COVID-19? Well, if you do have multiple myeloma and you have actively progressive disease, in my view, the best defense against any infection, including COVID-19, is effective treatment of the myeloma itself. And how this is done would depend on the stage of the pandemic we are facing at the time and whether or not there is sufficient hospital resources at the time to deliver the type of treatment that we need. But the overarching principle for us as health professionals is in patients who are progressing or at high risk of uh, progressing, we need to offer the best treatment possible within the available resource we have at the time of the pandemic. On the other hand, uh, for patients who are at low risk of progression, we would want to avoid non-urgent treatment to minimise uh, immune suppression and uh, to minimise the need to attend hospital unnecessarily uh, at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now in Australia, because our of our preliminary success in flattening the curve, that peak of the pandemic uh, may not happen for uh, several more months. And so that needs to also be taken into consideration. Now, how long can we afford to withhold uh, non-urgent but yet still important treatment for patients with myeloma who are deemed at low risk? Now, that's a harder question to answer. And so you can see the decision is not quite as straightforward as one I might have hoped. It needs to be individualised and so you'll still have to be guided by your haematologist. 
And so that brings me to the next question of autologous stem cell transplant and maintenance therapy. One of the common questions I get asked by my patients is, well, I'm due for an autologous stem cell transplant now, should I proceed? Well, autologous stem cell transplant remains an important part of upfront treatment in patients who are otherwise fit, uh, only because there's been studies to show that it does improve uh, progression-free survival at the very least. And so the decision of whether or not to progress or proceed to an autologous stem cell transplant in most institutions usually, usually relates to the inpatient capacity of that hospital at the time of the pandemic. What we don't want to do is put a patient through an autologous stem cell transplant at a time uh, when uh, intensive care beds cannot be accessed if it is needed. And so recognising this, uh, some hospitals have chosen to delay autologous stem cell transplant in some patients, but not omit, just delay. And the pharmaceutical benefit scheme uh, has now extended reimbursement, uh, allowing access of uh, more bortezomib-based therapy so that patient can remain on bortezomib-based treatment while awaiting for uh, autologous stem cell transplant. And again, the situation in Australia is evolving every day. And given the fact that the peak of the pandemic may not happen for many more months, this also needs to be taken into consideration. And in fact, at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, we feel that we do have a small window at this point to offer autologous stem cell transplant to some of our patients who are at higher risk before the peak of the pandemic occurs. What about maintenance therapy of lenalidomide, otherwise known as Revlimid, a post-autologous stem cell transplant? Well, maintenance therapy post-autologous stem cell transplant remains very important because it's been shown to improve progression-free survival uh, as well as overall survival compared to nothing. And in fact, uh, lenalidomide, otherwise known as Revlimid, is an immunomodulatory drug, and so most of us don't consider it to be an immune suppressive drug per se. And given the fact that it can be taken as a capsule by mouth at home, most haematologists will elect to continue uh, maintenance therapy with Revlimid. And what about bone strengthening treatment uh, with Zometa or Permidronate uh, therapy? Well, these bisphosphonate therapy remain an important part of supportive uh, care in minimising uh, the risk of fracture and optimising bone health. And in fact, uh, there is a, a, a British study called the MRC Myeloma 9 study that have shown that continuation of bortezomib long term can even improve overall survival. But then again, it boils down uh, to the, uh, the hospital resource and the stage of the pandemic we are facing at the time. There are now data to show that in fact, perhaps bisphosphonate therapy every three months may offer the same degree of bone protection as monthly. So we at St. Vincent's Hospital have to elected uh, to lengthen the frequency of bisphosphonate therapy uh, to every three months to minimise the need for patients' attendance to hospital at the time that we can uh, still afford to do so given our hospital a resource at, at present. So that is all I have to say for this initial segment. I hope that you have found this helpful. And until the next time, I wish you and your family the best of health and a happy social distancing. Thank you.